Tonight on Bridge City News, federal conservative leader Andrew Scheer went on the attack during question period again as a new report says China is now banning Canadian pork. Fish and wildlife have tips on how to protect yourself and your pet following the attack of a dog by a coyote in Coaldale. And the Lethbridge Police Service Watch program got underway this week. We caught up with some of the volunteers to how they are hoping to make your neighborhood a little bit safer. Your nation. Your province. Your southern Alberta. From the heart of Lethbridge. It's Bridge City News with Hal Roberts. Good evening. Thanks so much for joining us. There was a big blow today for those who oppose the carbon tax. The Saskatchewan Court of Appeal ruled 3-2 in favour of Prime Minister Justin Trudeau's federal levy. Saskatchewan Premier Scott Moe already said he would appeal the verdict to the Supreme Court of Canada. Lawyers for the province argue that the tax is unfair and unconstitutional. Federal Environment Minister Catherine McKenna was in Ottawa and praised the decision. In a statement today, Alberta Premier Jason Kenney said, We disagree with the narrow ruling by the majority that the federal government has the power to ensure a provincial minimum price on carbon and will be joining Saskatchewan in their appeal to the Supreme Court of Canada. The governments of Manitoba and Ontario are also challenging the carbon tax in court. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau has said that pipelines are a priority for his government. Our parliamentary reporter Ray Fillion says, however, that many in the Liberal base are not big fans of the Transmont Pipeline expansion. Uh, they think that approving the Transmountain Pipeline expansion would actually be a bad idea for the Liberal brand. They believe that their party should do more for the environment and that, you know, approving the Transmountain Pipeline expansion would be, uh, you know, counterproductive in, in, in that way. As, as we talked about last week, uh, there was Mark Garneau who said that uh, making that project uh, a reality is priority number one right now for the federal government. Uh, they're, they're supposed to decide to make it a final decision on Trans Mountain by June 18th. They keep saying it's their number one priori priority. We'll see how it goes. Catch my full interview with Ray Fillion talking pipelines and how Premier Jason Kenney's meeting went with PM Justin Trudeau. That's coming up after business news. China has now decided to ban pork products from two Canadian companies, including one in Red Deer, Alberta. The federal Conservatives are asking the Trudeau Liberals what is being done about it. Tory leader Andrew Scheer and Agriculture Minister Marie-Claude Babot exchanged shots in question period on how to best handle the issues involving China. It's not just administrative reasons when you've got two Canadians unlawfully jailed in China. Now our canola exports are being unfairly blocked and we can add the pork producers of this country who are those paying for the mistakes of this Prime Minister on the world stage. And what is the Prime Minister's response in terms of these attacks on nothing. Canadians' interests? Absolutely nothing. nothing. But it's worse than nothing. They're still sending Canadian tax dollars to the Asian Infrastructure Bank, which is run by China. So how many more people and how many more industries will have to suffer before this Prime Minister finally takes action? What's going on with the pork industry is an administrative issue and I'm confident that we will find a solution very rapidly. Mr. President, Conservatives are keeping playing little politics, playing politics, and I, I would like you to know that today we have learned that the leader of the opposition is refusing to allow an independent check on the cost of their promises. So I think that the Conservatives are hiding the, the same way Doug Ford is hiding. New poll by Angus Reid is out and it says if the federal election was held today, the Conservatives would win a majority. Here's how the numbers break down. The Federal Conservative Party of Canada now leads the Liberals by 13 percentage points, 38 to 25 percent, when it comes to voters' intentions. The NDP is third with 18 percent, followed by the Green Party at 11 percent. The Quebec Party, the Bloc Québécois, is fifth with 5 percent, followed by Maxime Bernier's People's Party of Canada with 3 percent. Now, when it came to who is most popular for the Canadian leaders, the Green Party's Elizabeth May has a positive approval rating. 45% approve of May, while 34% of Canadians disapprove of her. Conservative leader Andrew Scheer has a 40% approval rating and 46% who disapprove of him. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau, 67% disapprove of his leadership, while only 28% approve. NDP leader Jagmeet Singh has an approval rating of 34%, while 45% do not like the job he's doing. It should be interesting to see how all of the federal party leaders can approve their images in time for the October 21st federal election. Lethbridge Pro-Choice has thrown its support behind the city of Lethbridge over its decision to remove pro-life ads from buses and bus shelters last year. 
The group said in a recent statement that all public spaces should be free of harassment and manipulation that has been found in these anti-abortion ads. The Court of Queen's bench hearing on the issue is scheduled for October the 10th. Lethbridge Pro-Life says the city violated its right to free speech by removing the ads. Lethbridge Pro-Life lawyer Carol Crossan noted a case involving the Greater Vancouver Transportation Authority versus the Canadian Federation of Students in which the Supreme Court of Canada ruled that the right to freedom of expression is important, including what may seem controversial. Crossan says the government needs to remain neutral and to protect the right free speech for both sides. One of the new programs the Lethbridge Police Service rolled out to deal with the city's drug crisis is the new watch program. Members completed their training, received their red uniforms, and have been visible in the city's downtown core. So far, members of watch say they've received a positive response from the community. We've had EMS calls, we've had needle pickup, uh, we've utilized uh, DOT, um, that's the transportation service, um, through CMHA. Um, to get people from one area of the town to the other. So the calls have been varying. The nice part is is that the feedback from the community as we talk with local businesses and, and work with them, um, it's encouraging. You know, you get people honking and giving you the thumbs up. So it's, it's, it's encouraging to know that there is support from the community to try to work together and help each other. Watch modeled after programs in Vancouver and Winnipeg was developed by Lethbridge to deal with the city's drug crisis downtown and to help citizens on the streets deal with whatever problem they have to handle. Lethbridge Animal Service has been receiving an increase in calls of cats being hit by vehicles. As of April 1st, the city has responded to 15 cats being run over. The group is encouraging cat owners to be responsible and monitor where their pet is at all times. They also warn drivers to keep an eye out for our furry friends day or night. We're really trying to educate, uh, especially cat owners, to ensure control of their animal, make sure they know where they are. Uh, really, they shouldn't be leaving your property. In fact, Indoor cats are probably the safest cats. An indoor cat can live to be, you know, eight, nine, ten years old, sometimes older than that. They say a cat that's normally left outside on a regular basis, you're shortening its life to probably two to three years. If you buy a pet and, or a cat and take it home, it's obviously something you're, you want to love and show affection to as part of your family, so there's really no reason to be letting it wander the streets in the middle of the night or whatever. You, you wouldn't do that with your children. Most people don't do that with their dog. If you see cats around, slow down and ensure that they are aware that you are there. Lethbridge Animal Services says if you spot an injured or deceased animal, to give them a call right away at 403-320-4099. Residents in Coaldale are being told to keep an eye out for coyotes after a dog was attacked and killed earlier this week. Alberta Fish and Wildlife is warning residents in more rural areas to always know where your pets are. Officials have tips when it comes to any future encounters with coyotes. Never make a coyote feel comfortable, so never offer food to the animal. Respond to their presence aggressively by making yourself appear larger. Wave your arms overhead. Throw rocks or sticks at the animal. Shout in a deep voice, always maintaining eye contact, and never turn away or run. This will encourage the animal to chase you. If you do encounter a coyote, Call the Report a Poacher number at 1-800-642-3800. The annual Jane's Walk Festival starts today and concludes Saturday with 13 informative guided walks being offered around the city to help residents appreciate this place we call home. Well, Jane's Walk is an annual festival that takes place here in Lethbridge and in cities across the world. It started in Lethbridge in the year 2012, and we were inspired by walks taking place starting in Toronto in 2007. They started the year after Jane Jacobs, who was uh, an important person in bringing together community in New York and Toronto, um, getting people involved in her community. She passed away in 2006 and people thought what a great way to honor her to hold volunteer-led free community walks to get people involved and out exploring their neighborhoods in a new way. For more information on the various Jane's Walk tours being held throughout the city, visit the Get Involved Lethbridge homepage. Good news for fans of the Nikiyoko Japanese Garden. It officially opened today for the season. Now, officials say the Winter Light Festival, which wrapped up in January, drew more than 14,500 people. For the opening weekend this weekend, the garden will be hosting a kite festival along with Okinawan donuts and daily tours. Also this summer, there will be sumo Sundays where guests will see live streaming of actual sumo wrestling while learning more about the sport. The Nikiyuko Japanese Garden will also be teaming up with the Lethbridge Bulls baseball team and will be offering authentic Japanese hot dogs at some of the games this season. Blood, sweat, tears and a ton of perseverance are just a few things required to be a high-performance athlete. As Ainsley O'Reilly reports, 
The Lethbridge Sports Hall of Fame, now in its 34th year, will be inducting its athletes this evening at the NBAC Center. Don Barry Furtado is now a school teacher in Coaldale. But something her students may not know about her is that she used to be a world-class golfer. Honestly, going back to Henderson Lake, just as a junior, playing on the Monday mornings, and we played 36 holes a day. So just hanging out with friends and, and playing and just being there all day. And some of those friends now are friends that I still have that are great friends. Tonight, she'll be one of nine people inducted into the Lethbridge Sports Hall of Fame with a career that has taken her as far as China. A former Oregon Duck, Dawn looks back fondly on her golf career. I'm significantly older and looking back, you know, you put a lot of time and energy into it and there's a lot of great things that I was able to accomplish. If you go to any Hall of Fame celebration, the best part is often the speeches. You get people that are truly emotional and, and, you know, on the verge of tears when they talk about what they've done. People who just are in a celebratory mood and, and are just happy. And I actually went over it with my mom the other day and broke down. So I'm not really too sure what this evening is going to bring and how, how well I'll do with um, holding up. You know what I mean? So I'm hoping... I don't shed a tear, but I don't, I don't know what to expect just yet. In its 34th year, the Lethbridge Sports Hall of Fame Committee has been unanimously approved by City Council to showcase some artwork at the ATV Centre. That way, friends, family and athletes can see their accomplishments forever. I mean, our primary mandate is the members, people who are inducted for the, you know, the lifetime of effort they've put in as, as athletes or builders or the way that they've contributed to uh, sport in the city. So to have a permanent site, which will be open next spring, uh, the way things are going, is just going to be uh, so good for the growth and development of the Hall of Fame to give a permanent site where people can go in a, in a visible area like the ATB Centre to go learn about the history of sports in Lethbridge, the people who have had an impact. It all goes down tonight, 6 p.m. at the NMAX Center. For Bridge City News, I'm Ainsley O'Reilly. Tomorrow is May 4th, and it's a great way for Star Wars fans who love to say, may the 4th be with you. Downtown Lethbridge's comic book store, Kapow, is giving you and your kids a fun way to celebrate. BCN's Loris Alexander will take you to the dark side. Oh, so work. Oh, no, he is. The force is strong with Stephen Ripkema, who works at Kapow and, like many of us, a Star Wars geek. I like eating a book here. I like running. Oh, thanks, pal. <laughs> <laughs> I like I like eating my top here. Okay. Eating. The stars and planets have aligned to bring us this monumental galactic event. Well, okay, that's that's a bit of an exaggeration, but tomorrow is not only May the 4th, but it also coincides with Free Comic Book Day. So May 4th, so May the 4th be with you, uh, is generally, like annually, a day to celebrate Star Wars. This year it happens to fall on Free Comic Book Day, which is the first Saturday of every May. It's been going for over 10 years now, so as long as we've been open, we've been celebrating Free Comic Book Day. This year's May the 4th will be tinged with sadness as Star Wars fans pay tribute to Chewbacca actor Peter Mayhew. Peter Mayhew passed away. He played Chewbacca. Um, he was just found in the 70s by accident by George Lucas. And this, the second he seen him, he's like, yeah, you're Chewbacca for sure. He wasn't even an actor. Um, and now he's one of the most iconic characters ever in cinematic history. Star Wars has captured the hearts of people young and old worldwide for over four decades. I remember sitting in my grandparents' house as a like, wee child just watching Star Wars over and over and over again. Um, and then, yeah, now as a much older gentleman still going and watching it. And now it's about to end. So. Kapow Comics and Games in downtown Lethbridge invites you out tomorrow to celebrate Star Wars as well as free comic book day. In a galaxy far, far away for Bridge City News, I'm Loris Alexander. May the 4th be with you. We have so many interesting guests here on Bridge City News. Recently we chatted with an astronomer, Dr. Hugh Ross. And we talked about the recent black hole discovery and how in the end so much of our universe declares the glory of our God. The universe has to be exactly the size and mass and the age that it is in order for us to be having this conversation today. The entire heavens declare the glory of God. As it says in Psalm 96, it also declares his righteousness. As we look out into the universe, we see there's not only a God that created it all, 
It's a God that's got a plan for us human beings. Catch the full interview with astronomer and founder of Reasons Why We Believe, Dr. Hugh Ross, coming up in the second half of our show. The flooding continues in Ontario and Quebec. So far, more than one and a half million sandbags have been filled to help residents in the Ottawa Catano regions. The Canadian military is being forced to adapt as it faces more calls for help with weather-related disasters. So I joined the military in 2002, and the first time I deployed on a domestic operation was 2017. So. Uh, this is a new, a new thing. I mean, it, call outs for the military to provide this type of support, uh, at least in my my neck of the woods, wasn't wasn't as common. So my job as the quartermaster, I deal with making sure that we have the supplies required for our troops to be able to execute tasks. Specifically, we're looking at things like ensuring we have the proper hand tools or support tools required to get different things done. Uh, food for the troops, obviously, and then fuel for our vehicles and everything we need in order to... Uh, we have lots of stuff to move, so just make sure that we're able to get all that done. It's not something that is easy to really prepare for because you don't know if it's going to happen. Uh, we have a saying in the Army, on the bus, off the bus. It's one of those, we're going, we're not going, we're not exactly sure what we need. And uh, so it's one of those things, you make yourself available to do that support. And uh, if they need you on the bus, you get on the bus and you go. The water is very high and a lot of people are, are fighting really hard to make sure that they can protect their property. Everybody here is directly affected by this, either through, you know, through family members or friends or whatever. Everybody's affected by this one way or the other. And uh, if, you kind of feel like this could be me in a way. More great movies are playing at the mill this weekend. With more on what you can look forward to seeing, here's Mr. Len Binning with another Movie Mill Minute. Family film Mia and the White Lion centers around a young 10-year-old who's unhappy leaving her home in England until she discovers a white lion born in captivity. Three years later, she's very upset as she finds out her father has plans for her friend. Give my ball back. You're lucky. He likes you. <laughs> the Best of Enemies is a story about Anne Atwater and C.P. Ellis. Two individuals who have to come together to discuss desegregation. The problem is, Anne's African American, CP's the head of the local Ku Klux Klan. In this true story, they become best friends. I'm holding the committee meeting. The council will vote to either adopt or reject school integration. I need two co-chairs. You and Ann Atwater. Ann Atwater. I'm the president of the Klan. From the producers of La La Land comes a new musical called Teen Spirit. Starring Al Fanning, with help from an unlikely mentor, she discovers what it takes to win with both integrity and hard work. Life comes down to these moments, Violet. <sighs> Don't take them for granted. Looks like some great movies to catch in the mill this weekend. We had kind of a mixed bag weather-wise for the weekend. Some sunshine, rain, even a potential of snow. Complete weather details are coming up. A mainly sunny day today, nice and warm, but tonight a chance of flurries developing in a low near minus two. Tomorrow, slight chance of showers, but warming up to 12 degrees. Sunday, periods of rain mixed with snow and a high of only three. There will be a break in the moisture on Monday and we should see a high near nine. Tuesday, the rain returns with a high of eight. Rain and nine expected on Wednesday. More showers and a high of nine again on Thursday. Looking at the Almanac, the average high for this time of year is 16 and an average low of 2. The highest temperature on this date was recorded in 1998 at 28 degrees and the record low was minus 8 in 1956. Sunrise was at 606, sunset at 851. Looking at the national forecast for tomorrow now, Victoria will have loads of sunshine in 18, just a few clouds in 17 for Vancouver. Periods of snow at 4 in Calgary tomorrow. A good chance of rain at 5 for Edmonton on Saturday. Regina will be mainly sunny and 10 degrees. Just a few clouds and 7 is on tap for Saskatoon. Lots of sunshine and 10 degrees for Winnipeg. In the central part of the country, Toronto will have periods of drizzle and 14. Ottawa will be mainly cloudy and 17. Montreal will be overcast and 14. In the Maritimes, Fredericton, New Brunswick will have showers and 12. Halifax, Nova Scotia will have rain and 7. Charlottetown, PEI will also have rain and 8 degrees. And in St. John's, Newfoundland, expect lots of clouds and a high near 5 degrees tomorrow. China has suspended the export permits of two Canadian pork producers, including Olimel LP from Red Deer, Alberta. Agriculture Minister Marie-Claude Bebeau says administrative issues related to routine customs inspections are to blame. Bebeau says the Canadian Food Inspection Agency is looking into the situation. 
The suspension comes amid strained relations between the two countries following last December's arrest of a Huawei executive. China has since arrested two Canadians and halted canola imports. TransCanada says its first quarter profit jumped nearly 37% to $1 billion. The pipeline company credits its legacy assets along with roughly $5.3 billion of growth projects that were placed into service in the quarter. The company says comparable earnings were up 9% from the same quarter to $987 million. Revenue edged up to $3.49 billion from $3.42 billion a year earlier. a and Revenue Royalties Income Fund is reporting a 9.5% decline in its first quarter. It was mainly due to a non-cash loss on a non-interest rate swap. The fund says it had net earnings of $5.7 million. That is down from $6.3 million a year ago. Overall, restaurant sales increased to $308.8 million from $267.7 million. Royalty income grew to $9.3 million from $8 million a year ago. General Motors is recalling over 368,000 pickup trucks and other trucks around the world. The company says it received 19 reports of fires caused by block heater cords. The recall covers certain 2019 Chevy Silverado 4500, 5500 and 6500 trucks along with 2017 through 2019 Chevy Silverado 2500 and 3500 trucks. The GMC Sierra 2500 and 3500s were also affected. All have GM 6.6 liter diesel engines with an optional engine block heater used to keep the block warm in extremely cold temperatures. Now, here's a look at today's markets. Recapping one of our top stories this hour, there was a big blow today to those who support the carbon tax. The Saskatchewan Court of Appeal ruled 3-2 in favour of Prime Minister Justin Trudeau's federal levy. Saskatchewan Premier Scott Moe already said he would appeal the verdict to the Supreme Court of Canada. Alberta Premier Jason Kenney said the Alberta government is joining Saskatchewan in their appeal. The governments of Ontario and Manitoba are also challenging the carbon tax in court. The Chinese tech giant Huawei may not be playing a role in Canada's upcoming 5G network. Our parliamentary reporter, Ray Filion, will explain shortly. But first, here's a look what's happening in and around your community. Here's your Bridge City News community calendar. The annual Pottery and Glass Art Spring Show and Sale is being held until May 4th at the Westminster Community Hall in Lethbridge. Discover unique gifts and home decor made by local artists, such as jewelry, stained glass windows, dish sets, mugs, and so much more. Admission is free. For more information, visit the Old Man River Potters Guild Facebook page. The annual Kids Tots and Babes Garage Sale is taking place Saturday, May 4th from 8.30 a.m. to 12.30 p.m. in the West Pavilion at Exhibition Park. Admission is $4 for adults. Come browse through dozens of tables full of new and used kids' clothing, toys, furniture, books, hair accessories, sporting goods, and more. If you'd like to rent a table, there is still room available. Email Sharon at totsgaragesale.com. Lethbridge Bike Fest is a full month of exciting and informative events encouraging you to get out and ride. Taking place Friday, May 17th from 2 to 4 p.m. is the Bike Mechanic Workshop at the Crossings Branch Public Library in West Lethbridge. Have the helpful technicians from Ascent Cycle get your bike into tip-top riding shape for summer. For more information about this and other Bike Fest events, visit yqlbikefest.ca. And that's your Bridge City News Community Calendar. Canada has not had an ambassador to China for over three months now. Tensions continue to grow between our country and the Asian nation. 
It seemed to all start with the arrest of the Huawei executive in Vancouver at the behest of the United States. Joining me now is our parliamentary reporter, Ray Fillion. Ray, it all began with Huawei, then a couple of Canadians being held hostage, and now the Canadian canola ban. Ottawa's announced some relief for canola farmers, but the Tories argue, you know what, it's not enough. Yeah, the situation just keeps getting worse. Uh, yeah, you're right. The, the Tories would like uh, the government to go further. They say that uh, Ottawa should stop contributing to a, a Chinese organization called uh, the Asian Infrastructure Bank. Uh, the Canadian government has committed $256 uh, million over five years to that organization. Now, the Liberals say it's good for Canada. Yes, it helps Asia. It helps many countries around the world. But what's good for the international economy is also good for the Canadian economy, they say. So that's the reason they're, they're doing it. Uh, but the Conservatives say that what Ottawa has been doing so far to help canola farmers is just not enough. Uh, the Liberals should be more aggressive. Now, what was announced earlier this week by Canada's agriculture minister is uh, more support for Canada's canola farmers. Uh, the one million per year for the advanced payment program, for example, uh, is uh, being increased to $1 million. The current limit is $400,000, not $1 million. It's being increased to $1 million a year. And the loan limit for the Agri-Stability Program is going uh, up from $100,000 to half a million dollars. The deadline to apply has also been extended. So Canada is taking steps, uh, but the, the federal government intends to do a little bit more. The uh, Trade Diversification Minister, James Carr, James Carr this week said that uh, he's going to go abroad to try and find new markets for Canada's canola farmers because right now roughly 70% of our uh, exports go to China. So that's way too big a chunk. We need to diversify. So these are some of the measures that Canada has taken right now. But you're right, Canada still doesn't have a full-time ambassador to China. We're represented right now by a chargé d'affaires in Beijing. It's been the case since late January when uh, uh, the ambassador, uh, Mr. McCallum, uh, lost his job after uh, making some controversial remarks. But uh, the prime minister says they're still looking for an ambassador. Uh, they want to take their time, uh, he says, to find the right person. But he claims that Canada is well represented right now in Beijing by uh, its chargé d'affaires. Ray, let's get back to Huawei for just a moment. Ottawa has yet to decide on whether to allow Huawei to play a role in Canada's upcoming 5G network. Can you explain? Well, yeah. I mean, many of Canada's allies, including the United States, have decided to ban Huawei on suspicion that uh, it's actually a way for the Chinese government to spy on, on countries. Actually, earlier this week, there was a piece in the news saying that uh, British telecommunications company Vodafone has found that uh, Huawei used some hidden functions in, in their network to spy on some internet network in, uh, uh, in, in Italy. Uh, Huawei has denied being engaged in uh, espionage on behalf of the Chinese uh, government. But, you know, there's this big cloud of suspicion right now. The United States is trying to convince Canada to ban Huawei from its upcoming 5G network. But Canada says, we're going to be making our own decision. We have yet to make a decision. But the public safety minister, uh, Ralph Goodale, said this week that a decision will be made and announced before the election. So at least now we seem to have a deadline uh, as far as Huawei's uh, participation in, in Canada's upcoming 5G network is concerned. Alberta Premier Jason Kenney met with Prime Minister Justin Trudeau in Ottawa recently. Now, before their meeting, however, Kenney testified before a Senate committee studying the government's bill to rewrite the rules for environmental assessments of energy projects. Kenney says the bill is pushing thoughts of secession in Alberta. We used to Quebec talk about separating, but now Alberta talk about separating. He said he will launch a constitutional challenge if the bill passes as is. Ray, Albertans are not happy. Neither is our Premier, Jason Kenney. No, and it was plain to see during the photo opportunity, you know, uh, Mr. Kenny uh, didn't smile very much as he was about to sit down for uh, a meeting with uh, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau. The, the, the two of them, as you know, have known each other for a very long time. When Jason Kenny was immigration minister in the Harper government, Mr. Trudeau was for three years his liberal uh, critic. Um, but yeah, he didn't mince words uh, this week. He talked about uh, the possibility of Alberta maybe eventually seceding from Canada if Bill C-69 is not changing. He said that Bill C-69, as it is currently written, would be a catastrophe for Alberta's economy and a catastrophe for Canada's national unity. And 
some some of Mr. Trudeau's cabinet ministers didn't appreciate what Mr. Trudeau said. Uh, they said that uh, his words weren't helpful to the dialogue. They want to have a constructive dialogue with the uh, the new uh, premier of Alberta. They said that he's basically just like Doug Ford and uh, Andrew Scheer, the federal conservative leader. He's being very partisan. It remains to see if his visit to Ottawa will accomplish anything. But the, as far as I can tell, the Liberals are determined to pass uh, Bill C uh, 69 now. And you know, you talk to a lot of Albertans who voted in the UCP and Jason Kenney, and they're excited for the fact that this guy's a pit bull and he's got that relationship in Ottawa and he's fighting for Albertans right now. Now, will the expansion of the Transmont pipeline be approved? Some Liberals think it will not, Ray. Well, yeah, there, there are actually some Liberals who are lobbying the Prime Minister right now. This is something that Radio Canada reported earlier this week. Uh, they think that approving the Trans Mountain Pipeline expansion would actually be a bad idea for the Liberal brand. They believe that their party should do more for the environment and that, you know, approving the Trans Mountain Pipeline expansion would be a uh, you know, counterproductive in, in, in that way. Uh, as you know, the Liberals are trying to win seats in the province of Quebec, where the word pipeline is something that's become uh, toxic. We saw the whole debate a few years ago about uh, Energy East. Uh, their premier, Francois Legault, says there's no social acceptability for pipelines anymore uh, in that province. Uh, many Quebecers don't approve of anything that goes against uh, the green movement right now. So that's why some Liberal MPs are... are, are lobbying Prime Minister Trudeau, trying to convince him to, to say no to the Trans Mountain Pipeline expansion. Uh, we'll see where it goes. Um, as, as we talked about last week, uh, there was Mark Garneau who said that uh, making that project uh, a reality is priority number one right now for the federal government. Uh, they're, they're supposed to decide to make a, a final decision on Trans Mountain by June 18th. They keep saying it's their number one priority. Priority. We'll see how it goes. Ray, many people are concerned with our nation's deficit and debt. Some surprising numbers were actually published this week regarding the deficit, and it may not be as bad as we thought. No, some intriguing numbers. Uh, the March budget uh, projected a $15 billion deficit for the last fiscal year, the one that ended on March 31st. But the numbers for the first 11 months of the last fiscal year show uh, the government had a surplus of $3.1 billion. So how do you go from a surplus after 11 months to a $15 billion deficit after 12 months? That means for the last month of the last fiscal year, the government would have to uh, have a, an $18 billion deficit. We'll see how it goes, but the government claims that its uh, projection in the uh, March budget uh, is accurate they're still going to have a $15 billion deficit and an $18.9 billion deficit for, for next year. Let me remind you, Hal, in case you forgot, but I'm sure you didn't, that during the campaign, Justin Trudeau promised to balance the book by 2019. The Liberals keep saying it's not going to happen. I thought it was going to balance itself, but then again, you know, I've been lied to before. <laughs> That's what Mr. Trudeau once said, yeah. <laughs> as for economy, Ray, it's not running as strongly as it once did. No, uh, the Canadian economy actually shrank a bit, 0.3%, a 0.3% contraction in the month of February. Uh, those numbers were made public this week. And obviously last week we talked about uh, the Bank of Canada, which had decided uh, last week to hold off uh, indefinitely perhaps on uh, increasing the, uh, the interest rates in the country. Precisely because of that, the economy uh, has slowed considerably. It's not doing as well as it was. It's supposed to pick up uh, towards the end of 2019 and even more uh, next year. But for the time being, it uh, looks like Canada's economy is not doing as well as the Bank of Canada had it initially uh, predicted. Members of Parliament, including our very own MP here in Lethbridge, Rachel Harder, they're getting a raise. Tell me more about that. Yeah, an increase uh, many people across Canada will certainly envy, an extra $3,300 uh, over the next year. Uh, so that's taking a, an MP's basic salary to $178,900 a year. That's because of an automatic yearly adjustment that was uh, introduced nearly 20 years ago by the former uh, Jean Chrétien government. Uh, of course, members of parliament work very hard. They're spending a lot of time here in the nation's capital away from, from their constituency and their family. Uh, but the Canadian Taxpayers Federation this week said it's surprised by the extra amount of money they're getting. Uh, 
the CTF saying it looks like elected officials are getting a better deal than the people they're, uh, they're paid to represent. Wow. Now let's talk about the flooding where you are in Ottawa, also Quebec and New Brunswick. The feds are thinking long term when it comes to compensation and a plan as well to help a lot of those provinces. Yeah, absolutely, because it's absolutely uh, sad what's going on right now here in the nation's capital. Many areas remain underwater. They've, they've been flooded for two weeks. Uh, the, the Ottawa River, which uh, stands between Quebec, the Quebec and the Ontario sides, is, is at an all-time high, and it's probably going to remain at that level for another two weeks. So can you imagine the poor people living close to the, uh, uh, to the river? Uh, many have, have lost uh, everything. So, yeah, the federal government says it wants to strike a provincial slash federal committee in Ontario, in Quebec, and in New Brunswick uh, to try and come up with a new with permanent solutions, long-term solutions for, for these communities. Uh, does it mean they're going to be building uh, dikes? Does it mean that they're going to ask people, pay pe people to move away from those flood-prone areas? Uh, it remains to be seen, but the federal government says something must be done because of climate change. And I don't know if you've heard about that community north of Montreal where a lot of people are angry. There is a dike that gave way last weekend, flooding hundreds and hundreds of homes. Many people there, too, have lost uh, everything. We learned this week that municipal authorities knew there was a weakness in the dam, but they didn't do anything for 18 months. Uh, the mayor telling reporters that she was waiting to see if she could get a government grant uh, to do the work because uh, we're told that it's very expensive work that needed to be carried out. Uh, it, it, it wasn't done, and now a lot of people in her community uh, want to move. They want to go away. Many of them have lost everything. So a lot of sad stories right now in three provinces. That is very sad. You're right. Conservative leader Andrew Scheer has promised to unveil his environmental plan before Parliament rises for the summer. Many Canadians have been wondering, and he's going to deliver now. Yeah, he says he's going to deliver. The fact of the matter is he was supposed to announce that plan, unveil it last weekend at a, a gathering of uh, conservative militants in Victoriaville, Quebec. But because of the, uh, the floods in many uh, areas of uh, Quebec, New Brunswick and uh, Ontario, he's decided to hold off a few more weeks. He's now promising that he will unveil a plan that will contain a credible uh, targets to reduce Canada's greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, over the coming weeks, he's going to do so, he says, before par the parliamentary session uh, ends on uh, June 21st. The cost for Canada's campaign to get a UN Security Council seat is rising. Ray, do we even really need one? How important is it for Canada to have a seat at the United Nations? Well, Canada says it's important for its image. Remember when he uh, became prime minister, Justin Trudeau said Canada is back. Uh, the former Harper Conservatives failed to win a seat uh, in 2007 which was the first time Canada was denied a seat at the UN's uh, Security Council. So, yeah, the, the, the federal government has been campaigning actively. As you know, the decision is going to be made uh, next year. There's going to be a vote at the, uh, at the UN for a 2021 seat. Uh, Canada's in the running against two other countries. Since 2016, one and a half million dollars uh, has been spent, including a million dollars in the last 10 months alone. That's according to access to information documents obtained by uh, the CBC. We're talking about things like trips, uh, gifts to foreign dignitaries. There are also 11 government employees who are working uh, on Canada's bid here in Ottawa, but also in New York City. Uh, One and a half million dollars, by the way, is, uh, is quite the bargain compared to the $10 million Canada spent on its candidacy 20 years ago, the last time Canada won a seat at the UN Security Council. Ray SNC-Lavalin is haunting the Liberals once again, this time thanks to some illegal contributions to the Liberal Party of Canada. Well, that's right. It was revealed earlier this week that a decade ago, the Liberal Party of Canada received illegal donations from some uh, executives uh, at the company. Uh, it's a scheme that was concocted by former executives who, have, who are now gone. They're no longer working for SNC-Lavalin. The Prime Minister was asked about it this week. And he said that uh, things have changed within the uh, Liberal Party of Canada, that his political party would not accept those donations if they were made uh, to be made, uh, if they were to be made today. Uh, but still, this is a scheme that got the Liberals uh, $118,000 uh, 10 years ago, and $8,000 uh, went to the uh, Conservative Party of Canada under the same scheme. 
And for those Canadians who want an electric vehicle, electric cars are now a little cheaper to purchase thanks to new subsidy from the feds. Yeah, this is an announcement that was made in the last federal budget. We're talking about up to $5,000 off the cost of an electric vehicle and $2,500 for plug-in hybrids. Originally, this was supposed to apply only for cars that are uh, retailed at less than $45,000. But because the federal government want, wants more Canadians to go green, they've decided to, to raise that bar to $55,000. They want us to go green. There you go. Our parliamentary reporter, Ray Fillion, joining me once again from Ottawa. Thanks so much, Ray. You're welcome, Hal. Science have recently managed to find a way to get a picture of a black hole. You know, I was always fascinated by black holes when I was a kid. Wrote a book report about them back in grade nine. But there was always a mystery about them, wasn't there? What exactly is a black hole and why are they so significant? To talk about this and other subjects is today's guest, Dr. Hugh Ross, an astronomer and founder of Reasons to Believe, and he joins us now via Skype from Los Angeles. Dr. Ross, welcome back to Bridge City News. Oh, my, my pleasure. Thank you. Now, first of all, Doctor, can you really share with our viewers what exactly a black hole is? Well, a black hole is a massive body that's collapsing under its own gravity, and it's so dense that, that it just continues collapsing. In fact, the gravity is so strong that anything that gets close enough to it gets sucked into it, even light itself, hence black. So is it true that if you're able to live inside of a black hole and you shine a flashlight outside, that the light will not escape, nor will the sound escape if you, if you yelled? That's right. Although there is one idea of a black hole shrinks to a small enough size where it shrinks down to the size of atomic nucleus, uh, the stuff that's trapped inside could quantum tunnel out, but it takes 10 to the 66 years minimum. So we've not seen anything like that happen in the universe. The universe is way too young for that phenomenon to have occurred. Now let's talk a bit about your organization, Reasons to Believe. What is it all about? Well, Reasons to Believe, we're a group of research scientists, and uh, we pull scientific discoveries from God's book of nature to make a link to the book of scripture. You know, God gave us two books, and so we use these latest scientific discoveries uh, to bring people to the book of Scripture, uh, bring them to the Christian faith, and ultimately bring them to faith in Jesus Christ. Now, some people say you really can't mix science with faith. How do you harmonize the two? Let me ask you well, that. Well, science have brought me to faith. I mean, I was raised in British Columbia. I uh, didn't have Christian parents or Christian friends, but it was through my studies in astronomy I became persuaded that there had to be a beginning to the universe. And so I began to search for that beginner and found of all the world's holy books, only the Bible got all the cosmology correct. In fact, it predicted future uh, astronomical discoveries thousands of years ahead of its time. And that's what motivated me to sign my name in the back of a Gideon Bible, giving my life to Jesus Christ. And again, it's two books. God's responsible for the book of nature. He's responsible for the book of scripture. They're both communicating the same message. Now let's get back to black holes for just a moment here. Should we be concerned about black holes? Do they pose any threats to Earth? They would pose a threat if they were close. And this image that just got uh, processed by the Event Horizon uh, uh, team, they were imaging a black hole that's 50 million light years away. And even though it's pouring a very deadly radiation, or far enough away that it doesn't pose a risk to us. But it's one of the fine tuning arguments. We happen to be in a galaxy that's nowhere near to any other galaxy that's got a super giant black hole that could pose a risk for us. Uh, you know, the Andromeda galaxy has a supermassive black hole uh, that's 25 to 100 times bigger than our black hole. Uh, but we're far enough away, two and a half million light years, that it doesn't pose a risk. And so, yes. Black holes are a danger. In fact, black holes explain why, for most of the universe, life is simply not possible. But we happen to be living in that just right galaxy. Any potential of a sun maybe imploding, maybe not our sun, but maybe another star imploding and then within our own solar system and our galaxy, potentially becoming a black hole down the road? Our galaxy has got uh, several uh, stellar mass type black holes. 
And what I mean is a black hole is coming in at say five uh, to 10 times the mass of our star, the sun. So we have quite a few of those in our uh, Milky Way galaxy. What we see the Event Horizon team focusing on are what are called supermassive black holes. Black holes that weigh millions to billions of times the mass of our star, the sun. And these exist at the center of galaxies. Our own Milky Way galaxy is a supermassive black hole. Matter of fact, the team, that will probably be the next image they release will be of the black hole at the center of our galaxy. Now it's fortunate for the two of us is that the black hole at the center of our Milky Way galaxy only weighs 4 million times the mass of our star, the sun. And uh, we happen to be 26,000 light years away. And so it, because it's a small supermassive black hole and because we're that far away, it poses no risk to life here on planet Earth. But yeah, if we were orbiting any closer to the center of our galaxy, we'd be in big trouble. So how were scientists able to actually capture a picture of that black hole 50 million light years away? How was that done? Well, the event horizon is really tiny. Uh, we're talking something that's uh, a few times the size of our solar system, 50 million light years away. So the only way you can image uh, these black holes is with extremely high resolution telescopes. And what astronomers have done is they've linked together radio telescopes all across the planet and basically have simulated the resolution power of a telescope that's five to 6,000 miles across. And that's the only instrument we have today that's got the resolving power to actually see that really tiny dark spot in the midst of that bright sphere, you see, because outside the event horizon, you've got matter being converted into energy with about 10% efficiency. That explains why it's so incredibly bright outside the event horizon. And we've seen that bright stuff before, but we've not been able to see that little black spot defined by the event horizon. But now we got the telescope power to pull it off. And I can tell you another little tidbit, the very first experiment linking together radio telescopes thousands of miles apart from one another was done in Canada in the 1960s. So the technique actually originated with a radio telescope in Penticton, British Columbia, and one in Algonquin Park, Ontario. But now that's been exploited to involve radio telescopes all over the world. Back in the 1960s, that's pretty impressive. You know, the picture, I mean, we had it on Bridge City News as well, did not actually seem that impressive though of that black hole. So why all of the excitement? Because it's the first time we actually captured a picture of one? It's the first time we've actually seen that little central black spot that's defined by the event horizon. And yeah, they, the team has released the first image they've been able to pull off as a remarkable success. But their goal is to come up with much higher resolution images of these supermassive black holes, not only in that M87 galaxy 50 million light years away, they're especially interested in getting an image of the supermassive black hole in our Milky Way galaxy. And uh, where we get the payoff, if we can get high resolution images, we'll be able to tell something about the integration of quantum mechanics and gravity, what's referred to in astrophysics as quantum gravity physics. And this is one tool to be able to penetrate and see what's going on in the quantum gravity era of the history of the universe is looking, getting really high precision images. And that will tell us whether or not the space-time theorems hold all the way back to the very beginning of the universe. And as a Christian, I'm excited about this because that would give us definitive proof that a God beyond space and time created the entire universe. So yeah, I'm really excited about what's gonna be coming out uh, from future images. You know, for just a moment there, I felt like I was in an episode of The Big Bang Theory, and I was one of the characters, Kruther Polly and maybe Dr. Sheldon Cooper. I understand that Einstein's theory of relativity predicted black holes like this. Tell me more about that. Uh, well, it wasn't Einstein himself, but people who took his theory of general relativity and uh, basically determined that uh, it leads to the conclusion that you're going to get bodies massive enough that they're going to be able to collapse under their own gravity where radiation is not gonna be able to stop the collapse. And so that was discovered back in uh, 1939. And uh, actually a Canadian physicist was involved with uh, Oppenheimer in publishing the first paper 
that predicted there would be neutron stars and uh, black holes. And uh, so it, we, we've known about these for a long time, but now we're actually seeing these black holes. And that's what's so exciting to the astrophysical community. So Dr. Ross, the mass of the black hole, six and a half billion times as much as the sun. I mean, that's pretty big. How are they able to actually measure the mass of something that far away? Well, they do it using Newtonian mechanics. It was Isaac Newton who kind of laid out the idea that if you can measure the orbit of a body going about a really massive body, uh, knowing the distance between the body, uh, the orbiting body and the massive body and the speed with which it goes, you get the mass of the body. So it's just straight Newtonian physics, providing you've got measurements of stars orbiting that supermassive black, black hole or the gas that's orbiting about it, that will give you uh, the mass. And actually this image gave us an independent measurement of the mass of that black hole, but it was consistent with the measurements we already had. So yeah, it is really six and a half billion times uh, the mass of our star, the sun. And by the same token, we know that the mass of the one in our Milky Way galaxy is 4.02 million times the mass of our star, the sun. Because we can measure the orbits with much higher precision in our galaxy, we get a more accurate measurement of that mass. And you know, I've actually written about this in my book, The Creator in the Cosmos, the fourth edition. It came out a few months ago, and we predicted that these discoveries would be made, and it's actually going to lead to more secure evidence from a Christian perspective that the God of the Bible created everything, and we're giving that chapter away for free, reasons.org slash Ross. So if anybody wants to go into the details and to see the papers, reasons.org slash Ross. Intelligent design. Dr. Ross, now that they've captured the first ever photo of the black hole, what is the next big step for astronomers? The next big step is to get many more images, not just of this black hole, but of other black holes in the centers of galaxies. And the real goal is to be able to penetrate what's called the quantum gravity era. That's the physics of the universe when the universe was only one ten millionth of a trillionth of a trillionth of a trillionth of a second old. It's only that extremely early split second of the universe where we still don't have a complete understanding of the physics of the universe. These supermassive black holes have the potential, along with other, a couple of other observational techniques, to actually penetrate that era. That's what's driving all the excitement. We can actually understand the entire history of the universe from its very creation event uh, to the present. And I think that's going to provide us with even more compelling evidences in astrophysics that a god beyond space and time not only created it but designed it and one other thing we're going to find out is that actually the number and the masses of black holes both the supermassive ones and the ordinary ones we're going to discover that they're fine-tuned to make possible advanced life within our milky way galaxy so it's actually going to help us discern some of the personal attributes of the one that created space and time as the technology evolves with these incredible telescopes, do you think we'll ever see potentially life on other planets or maybe UFOs that are out there in other galaxies? Well, uh, we've now found almost 4,000 planets outside of our uh, solar system. And uh, when they were first discovering these in the 1990s, astronomers were predicting these planets would be just like the planets in our solar system. What they found is none of them are like any of the planets in our solar system. And this led to the discovery that every planet in our solar system is especially fine-tuned design to make possible advanced life here on planet Earth. So when our family celebrates Thanksgiving, we thank God not only for our planet Earth, we thank God for Mercury, Venus, Neptune, Uranus. We celebrate all of them because we realize if they weren't exactly the way they were, there'd be no Thanksgiving dinner on the table. And so it's actually revealed just how marvelously and uniquely designed. I can tell you this, everywhere we astronomers look outside of our solar system, we see conditions that are extremely hostile to the possibility of advanced life, which means we better take care of our planet Earth. There's nowhere else to go. You know, sometimes that blows my mind as well when reading God's Word. And I mean, we have billions upon billions of planets out there, but only one, as far as we know, has life. 
and God made that right here on earth. So in the end, how does this continue to remind us that the heavens declare the glory of God? Well, you made that comment about the billions. There's actually 50 billion trillion stars and about that many planets as well in the universe. What we now know make the universe slightly bigger than what we see, no possibility for light. Make it slightly smaller, no possibility for light. The universe has to be exactly the size and mass and the age that it is in order for us to be having this conversation today. The entire heavens declare the glory of God. As it says in Psalm 96, it also declares his righteousness. As we look out into the universe, we see there's not only a God that created it all, it's a God that's got a plan for us human beings that's going to live beyond the existence of the universe itself. Amen. He's got our backs as well. Dr. Hugh Ross, an astronomer and founder of Reasons to Believe, thanks so much for joining me today from Los Angeles. You're very welcome. On behalf of all of us here at BCN, I'm Hal Roberts. God bless and have a great night.